continue and say that I never dreamed that after 1958 that I would be showered with so many gifts in my life and this is one of one of those gifts that Baba is perpetually giving me and I'm always very happy to be here with you all. Uh, when we came down uh, we brought friends with us. We had a car full of people uh, from the area where we lived to uh, uh, the one woman I said, the Johanna Smith, and uh, Olivia Mom, and Ted Ken Teddy Canyon, uh, because as Ginny said, uh, we fish. We fish for Baba people. And we brought them down with us. And one particular friend, do you want to tell her about Olivia? Yes, uh, before the, the trip was uh, planned, I went out to shop one day. And... Um, for some reason or other, I went back into the house, and where I live, you have to drive to an A&P that's 10 miles away at the time, and you don't read while you're driving. But I stopped my car at the front of the driveway, went back into the house, and got the perfect master, and went back to the A&P, and put it in my wagon, not knowing why, and suddenly with the realization that I had a book, and I couldn't possibly read it, and why did I have this book with me and thought, well, people might even misunderstand the cover because Baba looks so much like Jesus holding the alphabet board. And in the 50s, you were a little leery of, of broadcasting this with, without any sensitivity. And I was pushing the wagon through the A&P when the realization struck me that, you know, I was doing something that made no sense. And a woman came up to me and said, where did you get that book? And I thought, oh my, <laughs> the perfect master. And, um, and she said, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, she said, I'm to be initiated in Vedanta by 5 p.m. And I cannot make up my mind, what is all this about? And of course, Baba had caught someone else who was to have been at the Sahabas, and we brought her down. So <laughs> Olivia was one, and so, was her friend, and so were two other friends. So we came down with this car full of people. Um, they had not heard too much of Baba, but were totally um, taken by him and wanted to see him in the Sahabas. Now, one person who did not decide to come was Ann Conlon. You've heard her story. So she did not come with us. And um, we came down. We checked in at our motel, and we waited for instruction. And the instruction was that we were to be available, of course, for Baba at any time always to be early. And we did have some free time, we thought, and we decided to go to the beach. Well, the friend that I had met in the AMP had asked my sister the winter before how she got such a suntan. And my sister said, well, I use Vaseline. When, when we go skiing. When we go skiing. And we left it at that. So we had a few hours, and still knowing Baba's way, we were young with Baba and knew, but still we already knew how you had to be ready for him and always be alert. But we really felt we had the time for the beach, and we wanted to see his house from the dunes. And at least we were waving and cavorting. It was so wonderful to be here and see him again. And uh, we spent the afternoon at the beach, with, uh, uh, no, an hour or so at the beach, I'm sorry, went back to the motel, and suddenly we got a call. Baba will see you sooner than you thought. And Olivia was in the shower and practically she was calling out to us, said, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. She was using boiling water and soap and uh, when, <laughs> when we went into the shower she had a knife and she was trying to scrape the sand off the Vaseline. <laughs> she wasn't ready to see Baba. And that was our first lesson in focusing first on Baba and not even going to the beach to get a suntan. Uh, then I will let you take. <laughs> we got here just in time, but John Bass was yelling, "Where were you? Where were you?" Baba is waiting. Now, uh, we uh, we were considered a group, and Baba ca called us in together with Johanna and Teddy Canyon and Olivia. And Johanna uh, knew Olivia from the Vedanta Society, and she had her head all full of uh, all kinds of uh, isms and ideas of things, philosophy. philosophy. And she came in, and she sat down in front of Baba, and Baba said, uh, do you know his, exa her, his exact words to her? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, he wanted to know what she knew about uh, God yeah. or uh, uh, his, her relationship in Vedanta or anything. And she started talking. 
and she talked. And all these ideas came out from Vedanta and, and probably all from her childhood about God and spiritualism. And, uh, and suddenly, she started to come apart. Her hair started, her bobby pins started popping out of her hair. <laughs> she, she threw herself down, her eyeglasses went crooked. The and words she came, were scrambled. She came completely unglued, this great big strapping woman. Uh, and she, finally, Baba lifted her up and he said, words, 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 don't you know that all that matters is God and love for God? And that was the end of Johanna. <laughs> <Correct. That's right. laughs> but Johanna was a woman who'd been to the Nuremberg rallies, who was in the Warsaw ghetto and escaped and lived in the forest outside of Warsaw during those terrible winters and had been through so much in her life and to see the defenses crumble in I may, I'll say 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> to see all of it fall away and the tears and you know her heart opening to Bob it was the most beautiful beautiful experience on the other hand we went down there thinking we were going to see our beloved again and have this wonderful welcome and the first thing we got was John Bass saying, oh, and Baba, they are here under great difficulties, and their parents do not want them here. And I thought, why is John telling Baba this? Why is he bothering Baba with these petty little problems of our lives? Um, and I was becoming more concerned about it, because nothing mattered but getting down here to see Baba. And I also, you know, when you're young, you want to sacrifice for a cause, and you want to be noble, and you really want to do the right thing. And it was so easy with Baba. Of course you wanted to see the beloved. Suddenly, Baba turned to me, pointed at me, and said, don't you think you're selfish? Don't you see me in everyone? I was so, I, I was so crushed. I could not believe that after 1956, when I felt all love with Baba, that I would be treated this way. And I heard a bellow come up from within me. I said, no, Baba, I didn't think I was selfish, and I didn't think, um, I didn't see him in everyone. I said, no, it's you, you're the one. And with Baba, I felt it was all right to talk in short talk. I was quite incapable of making a sentence, but I would say, th you know, one or two key words, and I knew he understood. He had to understand. Plus, he was putting these words in my mouth. <laughs> and then I said, I think it's happened before, and I didn't know what I meant by that, except suddenly I thought of Judas. I thought, and then I said to Baba, but it was for money, because, you know, my father said, I'll disinherit you if you go down. And, and being young, thinking, oh, you know, this was again something to overcome. Um, plus, I did not feel guilty. Then, my sister... After all this turmoil, I said, but Baba, they don't even know we're here. Uh, and then we went back to the motel, and there was a cable. They knew we were here. Yes. <laughs> but you also said, you know, when all, when all this passed, my sister also said, does that mean I should go home and live with them again? And she was 28 years old. <laughs> And he did chuckle. We heard a chuckle when she said, said, they don't know we're here. After all of this. After all of this. The, and, it, I mean, he did make me feel as though everything was all right, and that he also, um, he didn't take us too seriously. I had to work this out after we left the cabin about, did I see him and everyone, and don't, didn't I feel guilty? And I realized later, with Beryl's help, that I did not feel guilty, and that was okay. And also, Beryl said, well, he planted the seed in you to see him and everyone. And, um, but I've been chewing on that one all my life. He, he could give you one little line that you can chew on. And he knew, he knew I could chew on that for 2,500 lifetimes or more. Not only that, but our parents are still alive and they still despise Baba. Uh, and they still and might still be checking on us now and there might be a cable. <laughs> But they think about Baba all the time, and um, it's Baba this and Baba that, and they're <laughs> but they're very negative, and we realize that this is a meditation that is superb, and with Baba it does not matter, because love is love. No? Um, well, one of the things that happened was, of course, Baba uh, stayed in the lagoon cabin a lot, and we were all hoping to be called in to see him. 
And we stood around, and we stood around, and we stood around. And uh, suddenly I decided I'd better go to the bathroom after the second or third day, I guess. <laughs> the minute I got to the bathroom, he called. Yes. I could hear, Elizabeth! And I had to no, come running. Want to. But uh, after about a whole day waiting around, uh, incredible. <laughs> learning to be alert and ready for Baba no matter what and then of course as we read on over the years and saw how the Mandali and how the early years you know didn't even wait for you to finish pouring the tea uh, that you would uh, go immediately and we were so impressed with these stories that we applied them to every little moment that we could there was another incident um, a lot of times we speak about obedience which is something I know nothing about except you know, again from the negative side. Before Baba came, of course, in those days we got the family letters, and um, one of the letters said, please bring no gifts. I don't know what happened to me, I still don't know the people involved to this day, but a sewing circle called me up on the telephone and said <laughs> that we should make Baba all these lovely pillowcases and make him handkerchiefs and make him all these things that we bring. I wanted a sewing machine so badly, so I justified it because I bought it for Baba, not for myself. And I went out and I got the sewing machine on time and it had the zigzag. And I was going to make these wonderful faggoted edges and make handkerchiefs and linen pillowcases and satin, if you've ever worked on satin. And the more I worked on these things, the uglier they got. <laughs> that I did not have this talent. I didn't have this talent at all. But we did. Yeah, we managed. I managed to get these things tied up in a nice bundle. And we were waiting. The sewing circle met me the first day and said, I hope you're ready with everything. We're going to go in one day. And of course, we were waiting. I was waiting with the evidence was in my lap. And they said, sewing circle, please. And the moment my foot crossed the crossed the threshold, I remembered what Baba's request was. And there I was with the package. It was the one time I realized Baba's absolute power. And I turned to leave the lagoon cabin and found myself jammed against a wall. There was no door. And it was the hound of heaven. It was everything I'd written about. I was caught. I was caught, in my mind, displeasing him. I was caught disobeying, and I also saw how I deceived myself into thinking I was doing something for Baba. And being a lightweight <laughs> in the mind department, I did. I mean, I had a terrible, terrible moment, but inwardly I slapped myself, you know, get myself under control, and I said, you can't ruin your life and the time with Baba with this. And I turned around, and there was Baba smiling at me and I knew he understood, but I got my first taste of what obedience was. And Baba never tried me. He knew well that I couldn't obey that easily. So I didn't get many orders from him. Uh, <clears throat> standing around the lagoon cabin, uh, Kitty came up to me one day <laughs> and said, the door is, keeps slamming. Uh, you know, every time they opened the door, it would, uh, they'd close it and it would slam. And she says, can't you do something about it? She knew that I'd repair things. So I thought, ah, an opportunity to get close to the lagoon cabin. <laughs> I got as far as the door. Margaret crashed through the door and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and chased me off. And that was the end of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing happened to uh, standing around the lagoon cabin waiting. Um, was that prior to coming to Myrtle Beach, I had uh, delusions about being uh, a spiritual person uh, and loving God, uh, but it was like a child does, you know, you, you play at it. And I was standing around looking at the lagoon cabin one day, and suddenly I saw Baba's flag, and I saw these like magnetic fields coming out of it. And I thought, my God, there really is a God. And it was, it was a terrible shock. And I wanted to tear it. You couldn't play anymore. It was real. Uh, then I became the hound of heaven. Uh, but the, uh, I wanted to tear the flag down. I thought if I took the flag down, his power would be reduced or something. There really wouldn't be a god. Uh, but it, it's a shock to really see something uh, as awesome as Baba and the power he had. When you like to play at life. Yeah. 
I think many times a lot of us have said those are the most real moments of our entire life. When you're young, you think life is always like this, and we're going, you know, it's always going to go on. And in my mind, I thought our relationship with Baba would go on with the physical, knowing also that someday we have to find him internally. Uh, but at the time, it was the most beautiful time of our lives, and also the realization that this, he was the reason the universe came into being. And he was the most beautiful, beautiful creation of the entire universe. And it was very evident. Very evident. There was another, there was a thrilling day for me. The, the dancers carried the chair all around and all of a sudden at the beach, I was next to the chair and Baba had them put the chair down saying, now the women carry me. And I found myself at the front left handle with my left hand on the handle Directly behind me was Jane, and on the right behind me was Agnes Barron, and there was someone else in the front on the right, and I can't quite remember who it was. But suddenly the chair was picked up by Jane, who's about a head taller than I am, and Agnes, who's a head stronger than I am. And Baba started flying out of the chair. <laughs> and um, I don't know what possessed me. I've got to tell you, every time I ever spoke to Baba, it was like a baby speaking. Uh, the, the, I was just so simple-minded, and I threw, I threw my arm around Baba's knees, and before I knew it, I was saying, "Don't worry, Baba, I'll save you." <laughs> I was embarrassed. I really was. But I also, I also had injured my elbow terribly horsing around in college. You know, I was hit someone with a loose elbow and uh, I was waiting, I was really expecting the worst that this elbow would be damaged and Baba was going like this as he was rising up he had his, his hand in his shirt going the heart palpitations I'm so frightened <laughs> and Billy was saying now what are you up, Billy Eaton was saying now what are you up to Baba but I still was taking this seriously and um, I really saw him pitching forward and like a projectile and the next thing I said, I don't know why I said this, except I wanted to reassure him. <laughs> and I said, I thought of our height and our strength compared to the Indian women. Now I'm one of the last chauvinistic people in the world. I just don't say things like this. And I said, we American women are strong. And <laughs> it sounded like volunteering in the army. <laughs> That's why you're working so hard. <laughs> um, Needless to say, Baba had it all under control. But the punchline is that when he hit my elbow, he was as light as a feather. Even though all his weight was going forward, there was absolutely no sensation of weight. Yeah. And of course, you've heard that people have sensed Baba differently at different times, that he's asked the men to pick him up, and they couldn't pick him up, and other times he was weightless. And you had the sense of him also... Uh, there's a story about a rose bush that I will turn to my sister on. Uh, one day, uh, they let Baba out of the car. It's uh, a picture of, in the slide of myself standing there and smiling. Uh, and Baba was walking towards the lagoon cabin from the car. And I looked down and I saw a rose bush. People had made a path for him. And he was going to have to walk through that rose bush with just uh, sandals on and his light sadra. And I thought, my God, it's going to scratch him. And I suddenly felt a pat on the cheek, and I looked up, and he patted me and was smiling. Uh, and uh, I was so happy about the smile, I had forgotten about the rose bush. And I looked up two minutes later, and the rose bush was shaking. He had walked right through it. Uh, but he was happy that I was thinking about his welfare, I guess, probably the only decent thing I've thought of. <laughs> <laughs> At the same, another time when he was walking, because of the accident that you all heard about, um, he was told that he would not walk again, and the hip socket was totally um, damaged, and he did start walking for us, and, and many times people have said, we look so serious in the slides, and it really was the empathy we had when he walked, that we were imagining the struggle, and he was coming toward me, and I thought, I, I knew that he knew what I was thinking, and every, I think others felt the same way, and I was just thinking, Oh dear Baba, don't you don't have to do this for us to show us. And Eric said immediately, 
you know, uh, Baba said through Erich, the bliss, the bliss, you don't know the bliss. So the reassurance. Yeah. The, today is May 25th. I hope, because <laughs> I looked it up in the, um, <laughs> what happened that day in the Awakener. And, um, you know, so you heard what Sahabas was, and it's the intimate, it's a family gathering. And uh, Baba would always ask, did we sleep well? And that night there had been terrible thunderstorms, and I didn't sleep. And it was, we were st I was still new with Baba, so I did not know these facts. But I had the impression that Baba was working all night. It was just so intense. And the next morning, Baba wanted to know who slept, who didn't sleep. And he pointed to me, and I said, Baba, I felt you were up all night working. Is it good? And then other people said what their impressions were. Now, the strange thing was, he said he wanted us to sleep well. So, on the one hand, I got approval for being so sensitive. On the other hand, <laughs> I got this balance of, um, you should have slept well, it was my work <laughs> to do. <laughs> you know, it was, it was um, another bit of sensitivity to Bob. You just read The Awakener today. The Awakener. He, he had been, he could say he worked. Yeah, and he worked very hard, he said, that day. Uh, and the night, he had a terrible night. He had a very difficult night on that night. It was the night of the 24th going to the morning of the 25th. We also, when we received the, the gifts from Baba, you saw where the men went to Baba's house. Well, the women were called one day. And uh, Didi was up on the panel and told about being the last to receive the bracelet. But I was watching. And when Baba put that bracelet on, um, later I think you'll the rose bush episode and as we go on you'll see that Baba didn't move or walk or act as any other person we had ever seen. His, his gestures were beautiful. He had this perfect movement and the bracelet was on. It was a blur. The two bracelets and they were glass. So when we got home that night I wanted to take them off and save them because you know Indian glass bracelets and how they break. It took us at least an hour with the same Vaseline that we had used for sunbathing. Soap, ice water, everything. To this day, we will never know how Baba got these bracelets on. But when he put them on, they were on. We didn't know anything about, well, I, I didn't know anything about masters, really. I'd read a lot, but uh, you don't really know how to behave in front of a master until you've experienced it. Uh, so that whole day, it was trying to find out uh, what my relationship to Baba was, how I should act. I did all kinds of stupid things. But when I got back to the motel that night, uh, I realized that all day long, Baba had been pulling strings and controlling all the situations. And I started to laugh. And Ginny started to I laugh. I started to laugh. And we laughed. And we laughed. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, and poor little Dee Dee, this little girl. Were they, they laughing, laughing so hard? What is wrong with these crazy... All night, but it was incredible. There was a God. There was the Avatar. He knew everything. The synchronicity of the first day, much less the ninth and tenth day as we went, and the beauty of experiencing life with Baba was too much. I mean, it finally, it, we broke. We broke with it. And at least we didn't cry, we laughed. But, and as the time went on, we, we realized what level we were on. For instance, my mind was still the into, almost the entire two weeks. And I kept inviting people back in the car with us. This is why my sister mentioned first that we had five or six people in the car. Well, before I finished, all the dancers were coming home with us. It was a six-seat car. And, I mean, there was just nothing upstairs. And it wasn't the discursive mind. I was very aware, but I... He, it was so safe that you, you could stop thinking, you could stop planning, you could stop the discoursing in your mind and figuring things out and just surrender to the moment with Baba. And let me tell you, we may have looked funny, Donald, in, in uh, Bermuda shorts and those old-fashioned clothes, but everyone was so beautiful when Baba was present. Everyone really was, was sparkling. And Jeanette was not old. Oh, yeah, on the birthday party. I, I don't know how many of you knew Fred Marks. You must all know of him. And he was always very shy. And, um, not, I mean, you may think I'm not shy, but I'm a little shy. 
<laughs> and during the party, I found myself suddenly on a swing, and Fred Marks was swinging me to the music of The King and I. And it was just so natural that we were like children around Bob and enjoying ourselves. Also, the birthday party with the Prasad. It's your turn. Oh, well, I was uh, always shy, too. And, uh, but I also, in my younger days, had been quite an athlete. I'd be able to do all kinds of things with my body, jumping, leaping, grabbing balls. <laughs> and uh, I thought all this Prasad being thrown around, I could grab one just like that out of the air. And uh, people who are completely inept were, were catching, <laughs> catching the Prasad all over. <laughs> I was feeling badly about myself at that particular time anyway, and I was standing there at the end of the picnic table, and the prasad came right down the table and right in front of me, so I thought, well, I guess that's mine, and I took it. <laughs> I never did catch one out of the blue. <laughs> never showed her prowess, her athletic prowess. Also at the birthday party, I was in charge of the phonograph, and... Uh, Bob, the record was playing The King and I. I don't know if, how many of you saw the tape uh, last week that I showed of the uh, children's birthday party. Uh, but the um, uh, the record was going on and on, and I thought, oh, this is, maybe Baba doesn't want to hear this over and over again. And I thought, maybe I should put something else on, and my mind was going and going. So I sent a little boy over to ask Baba what we should do with the record. And Baba said, yes, keep playing it. And then I realized that I had been projecting on... Uh, continuously what Baba would like or he wouldn't like instead of just uh, waiting to see what Baba's answer was or asking him. We also had a wonderful uh, time with this high five. We set it up in Baba's house when, when we weren't, didn't have it in the barn or we didn't have it in the yard uh, for the party. We set it up in Baba's house and my sister and I picked out the St. Matthew Passion and the St. John Passion the St. John Passion <laughs> and Pulse there. the Planets and we stacked the records on the machine for Baba to play well a couple of days we went back there later and he hadn't played these records and by then we knew better and we grabbed the records <laughs> threw them in the trunk of the car and thought Baba can play anything he wants yeah. to they were so heavy yeah. our idea we what would be appropriate wrong. really heavy all in German too <laughs> <laughs> and you know it was trying to relive a past experience which is I mean it's lovely to acknowledge him from before but we were with Baba in the now and one day in the barn came an example of forgetting everything it goes back to when when he was in Kashmir I think where uh, Elizabeth ran to see where Jesus or Moses had been buried in the past and he said why do you leave me now to go see what the past was and it happened to have been the anniversary of Pentecost. And one woman in the audience said, oh, does this have anything to do with the Pentecost? And Baba's face was so pained. This was, he didn't have to lecture us. We learned from experience being with him. It was very obvious that, to speak of that, it is not the time to speak of that. It was, uh, a tremendous learning experience for for us. Uh, I remember uh, Beryl Williams uh, telling us how to act around Baba before we came down. She, we asked her for advice. And she said, concentrate on Baba. Just watch Baba all the time. So while in the barn, we used to have um, rest periods and stretches. Baba didn't get up because of his hip. He just stayed there. And other people would walk around and rest and stretch. So I just sat there and I watched Baba. And one of the things uh, that happened was a woman brought him some little flowers, little, beautiful little wildflowers. And he took them and he twirled them in his fingers like this. He twirled it and twirled it and twirled it and then threw it, just flicked it. And it went and landed in the woman's lap. She was sitting there with her skirt on the floor and it landed in her lap. Uh, after the meeting was over, I went out into the uh, compound and I found the same little flower and I picked it up. It was full of thistles, tiny little thistles. And if you twirled it in your finger, it would... Uh, it would stick, yes, like nettles. And Baba must have taken all those nettles off before he'd thrown it back there. And another thing happened. He was sitting there, and an ant was on his lap. And he sat there, and he was so natural. Uh, <laughs> because we were used to not being natural. I don't know if you know people in the 30s and 40s used to make speeches all the time when they talked, and they were unnatural. Baba was very, very natural. <laughs> we're not and, doing it now. <laughs> 
And he looked at the ant, and he studied it, and he looked at it, and then he shook his shirt and flew off. And that was the end of, you know, his uh, relationship to the ant. <laughs> or the, or the beginning. But the way he studied it was uh, very interesting. Oh, there was another time, because Anne is here, this is for her, we were sitting in the lagoon cabin, and Anne had heard of Baba, but wasn't sure about coming down because of the requirements, and, you know, I didn't say enough either. But anyway, I was thinking of Anne, and when I think, sometimes it's just in a picture. It wasn't a string of words. And I just got a picture of Anne, and suddenly Baba turned and said, what do you do? And that's when I said, I don't know where it came from. I said, I fish. I was fishing around in my head to see if <laughs> Anne would. And the moment I said it, I knew that he had taken over. It's just the way he said, fine. <laughs> and there was this picture of Anne. And it just was so easy. <laughs> no long explanations. Another thing happened in the barn. As you know, uh, Harry Kenmore used to get up and say the Master's Prayer. I remember the first time he said it, he said it beautifully. And then as years went on, he got louder and louder and more firm in, uh, in his per performance of it. Uh, and one day he was standing there uh, saying the Master's Prayer. His back was a little bit to Baba. And Baba was watching him very intently, and Harry was going at it. Uh, and Baba looked at him and he said, Did you forget? Did you forget it? And Harry didn't hear him. He, he couldn't hear. He was deaf. And he didn't see Baba. And a, about 30 seconds later, Harry stopped in the middle of it, and he couldn't remember where he was. Just, you know, it was a, such power of suggestion Baba my head. <laughs> Behind his back. Did you forget? He went. And he did. Uh, without no, knowing why or how. <laughs> But today people talk about synchronicity and it's being appreciated more that there is no chance and that there isn't coincidence. And it was very obvious with Baba that every split second and microsecond was, and was so exceptionally done and how life was all connected and uh, how aware Baba was. During the birthday party, I asked for internal permission to take the pictures. And thank you for having them on the slide. I had no idea that would happen, but they were the black and white with an ancient Kodak, a little box brownie. And when I asked for permission, I started focusing on Baba, and the back of his head started disappearing, and his neck, and then his ear. And I don't experience things like that. And it's when I truly realized he wasn't the body. And then he turned and looked at me and, and gave me a smile as, did you like that? Every <laughs> once in a while, you'd get this secret smile. And when we were in the barn, everyone would say, well, he looked at me. He looked at me. He looked at me. Oh, no, that was me. <laughs> that was me. Oh, and then when we went in for our gifts, we really don't remember uh, the spaces we were in sometimes. We can't, we can't remember if it was on Baba's house porch that we walked through the porch when we received the gifts, when the women received them. We received stick pins. And um, I was ashamed to tell this story for many years, but it's part of what happened here. When Baba gave me my stick pin, I had my hands out, and he put the pin, it looked like a tie pin with his picture on it, and he put it in my hands, and I thought he was embracing me. This is what would happen very often. He could have been just standing there, but you felt your arms around him or enveloped by him. It was always on the edge of feeling something more that was actually happening. And I really thought he had his arms around me, and I squeezed what I thought was a stick pin. And I must have squeezed his hand, and it must have hurt him. I, I want to say a little bit. And he went like this, and that's when I realized. And um, I was so, I really was so upset about doing that that I, I didn't tell that story. But it's also because I never, I hardly knew what I was doing when I was around Bob. I was always so transported. One day, uh, the Sufis showed the film. Yes. I've forgotten about that. Um, at the whole... Charmian's film. Charmian uh, Deuce's film of the, uh, the ocean coming in at the beginning and saying Bob and everything. And Bob said we had to stay awake. And I remember sitting in the back of him and seeing the back of his head, and I thought his, the back of his head was incredible because it seemed to be infinite. 
good, good to my mind anyway. But I kept focusing on Baba's head and he kept saying, stay awake. And I kept looking at this film and my eyes were getting heavy and it was very hot in the hall. And the film was of the ocean coming, coming out and coming in. <laughs> Coming out and coming in. It was very artistic. And it was coming out and coming in. And it was 110 degrees in there. And my head was going like this. And it was, uh, we dramatized it. These are orders from Baba. We have a chance to obey him. This is a request. It shouldn't be difficult at all. It was so difficult. <laughs> what a wonderful experience. There was a lot of humor around Baba. There was such a lightness, and there was such camaraderie, warmth, family. It was the ideal family. It was um, it was not heavy. That moment I told you with the sewing circle, I realized that I could ruin my life with hanging on to this moment of feeling guilty or feeling responsible. I did it. I was wrong. I brought a present. That's it, it was over. And Baba's timing was like that every split second. If something was over immediately, this gesture, you know, that's either very good. Yes, do you remember when, uh, who was it made the Polaroid pictures? Was it Wendy? Wendy, Wendy. Wendy made the Polaroid pictures and Baba looked at them like this. But the next moment he was doing something else. This was a wonderful thing to see the Polaroid pictures. And, but no one was left out, there was someone else waiting for attention. And it went on and on like that the entire time. And Baba would do something uh, when you least expected it. Uh, I was uh, standing up behind the, in front of, up here, the um, original kitchen, and Baba went by in the car, uh, oh, probably the length of this room away. And I looked up and I saw Baba's eyes, and they were absolutely gigantic. I'd heard about people looking at Baba and seeing his eyes, but big and black, and that's all I could see. It was absolutely incredible experience. Uh, also, the first few days, uh, standing outside of the lagoon cabin and going in and out, I suddenly started to feel the love that Baba talked about. Uh, and it was, I suddenly felt love for everything, for no reason. And to me, that was such an incredible experience. It wasn't to love somebody or something. Just suddenly having love for no reason, without a motive, was a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, uh, it came from Bob. Are you tired, Kitty? No. Or are you sure? We also had the wonderful moments in the barn when we heard Begin the Begin, and there was a veery in the woods singing, and literally you could hear the trees swaying, and you could hear the, 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 the ocean shore, and these were the most magical moments uh, that we shared with Bob. Uh, there was another time when Max Hefliger brought some records from Switzerland, and they were very touching, uh, church bells that had always meant a great deal to me. And Baba looked at me, and, and it, I shared the bells with him. So often in our lives we want to share with someone. And once you share with Baba, you know that you have the absolute divine beloved to share everything with. You're never alone again. And that was a beautiful moment to learn. And Deep River was especially touching. Um, wanting to go home again is one of the lines, you know, go home, cross over Jordan. And that was very special, because I swore Baba looked at me, and everyone else swore Baba looked at them. <laughs> <laughs> and he had. And he had. And he had. Yeah. And the dancers, I'm so glad many of them here. That was so special. That was very, very special. Uh, I have always been very fussy about my automobile. I loved my car a lot, and I took care of it, kept it shine. One day I looked up and all the dancers were sitting on it, on the, on the roof, on the hood. I know. <laughs> Baba's little present. Yes. Oh, and there was one night, we can't quite remember, maybe Andy, you do, when Baba said we could go out to dinner. Do you remember that? I, we had the impression that we could go out to dinner one night. Uh, up until then, we thought that for the rest of our lives, every moment, we could spend on a spiritual level. And Baba said we could go out to dinner. By the time we went out, 
we were so crazed <laughs> by seeing a tablecloth and salt and pepper shakers and dinner. We ooh and ah and isn't this wonderful? <laughs> Bob knew exactly the right moment when we needed a break from spirituality, so-called, you know, what we considered being spiritual and being away from the world. Now I think over the years um, it doesn't matter so much anymore. But then uh, getting out in the world or coming here was very important. There were two very different. Experiences for us. Yes, mm. that was quite a moment. Thanks. Very subjective for everyone. Um, I knew this was something I had never seen before. It was when Baba went into his universal work. And it, I knew it was something I had never seen before. It really didn't fit into any category. I couldn't make, uh, I couldn't discern anything from my past experience. And because it was Bob, I just let it go. And only one person out of the 225 lost their uh, composure. At the same time, our recreation director that Elizabeth had hired to take care of the children was in the group, and he'd been a very sophisticated man. He was an editor of an, of a an American, you know, huge nationwide magazine. He'd been around in the world, and he was observing this as an outsider at the time. And he said he had never seen anything like it. How everyone just stood and formed a circle and waited patiently. And he said where it could have been a situation where people could really have um, become quite disturbed, but with Baba there, there was the there was the level where he was he was doing what. Baba did. I wasn't quite sure, but I'd heard of his universal work. And then later, of course, we were told that he had a share in his work. Also along that line, I had the intuition a few times that being with Baba was not only personal, it was not for me personally, but that I was a type. And this was part of the work that Baba would have us there. That some of it was not that personal. Uh, later on, Joe Blake, this was an interesting story, it was Dee Dee who insisted on coming into the barn and not being in the playground. She wanted to know why these grown-ups were in there with Baba, and she often sat at Baba's feet. So Joe Blake was already jobless after one day, and so he just stood around. And a few times, in between seeing Baba, he would wander around mumbling, who is this? And I'm sorry to say I sort of ignored him a day or two. And uh, we did say wonderful stories about him, but we didn't say who he was. And what? And when the men were asked to Baba's house, he went along. And the love that Baba gave him absolutely demolished him. He came staggering out in the woods. We didn't see him for hours. He was bumping into trees <laughs> and crying. I mean, no one had to tell him. He simply experienced Baba's love just waiting in the barn. It's another beautiful to see someone move like that. I've run out of notes. <laughs> oh yes, I, I thought I told it. Um, Beryl had always wanted to carry the umbrella for, over Baba. And uh, in the movies, it's, it's very obvious that uh, uh, Anita was holding the umbrella over him. And Baba took the umbrella away from uh, Anita, but so sweetly, and blew her kisses, and there was it here. And he handed over to Beryl, and Beryl beamed, and Anita wasn't uh, um, disturbed by it because, because of the, the, the sweetness of the way every, Baba did things. Maybe I can find something in here. <laughs> Um, I, had, I ended up staying on the lantern, uh, and Phyllis Fredericks was one of them. And I was going through some, a little turmoil about Baba. And I remember Phyllis standing there ironing something. And she was smiling, and she said, All you have to do is love him. And I'll never forget that. Yeah. All you have to do is love him. How about the baby story? Tell us a deity story. Well, I told you how she got Joe Blake unemployed in one day. And um, 
you know, we were all each on our own. I wasn't aware of anyone else. As a matter of fact, I don't remember speaking to the Mondley. We did. We didn't meet. Andy, did we spend time chatting and having tea? Oh, and, and the same. <laughs> no, we were focused on Baba. And uh, so, oh, there was one time when Baba said that he had um, Larry Carish and his mother on the stage, and he said. This is not your child. All children are mine, and I felt good about that because I, you know, I always knew it. Not <laughs> uh, didn't always act it, but knew it, and that w that was a very lovely thing to hear. So I guess I let Baba take over the time we were on the center, and I didn't see that much of Dee Dee. But when she did sit at his feet one day, he what we call it worked on her head <laughs> sorry Dee but he was making these signs and tapping on her head and making all kinds of